Well, with that, again, welcome. I am Pastor Chris. Welcome to Glory Baptist Church. This is uh, our third week in a sermon series called Simple Rules for Life. And we're just going to jump right in, so saddle up. Here we go. Um, I used to know a guy by the name of Dave. Now, that's not his real name. We'll change the names of the story to protect the guilty. But uh, uh, Dave, um, Dave was, was a really interesting guy. Dave, Dave was a quite interesting guy. And Dave loved music, particularly loved going to concerts, particularly loved going to the concerts of a specific band, a band by the name of U2. You may have heard of U2. They played a Super Bowl. They, you know, probably the, one of the largest, if not the largest, grossing bands in the world for their live concerts. Huge stage productions, just amazing stuff that they do. And so anyhow, um, the band was coming to town where, where Dave was living, and Dave being the super fan that he was. Now, I, I should preface this. This is back kind of in the dawn of the internet days. So you couldn't go online and buy your tickets. This is back, you know, before smartphones or any of that kind of stuff that existed. So anybody under the age of about 25 may not remember those days, but they did exist back in the Stone Age. Some of us lived through it and survived. But this is back in the day before you could get online, pick up your tickets. And so Dave as a super fan, wanted to make sure he got the best ticket possible. So two days before tickets went on sale, Dave went down to the stadium where they were going to be selling the tickets and started camping out. And he was pretty close to the front of the line. He was pretty encouraged by that. He was afraid he might have gotten there too late, but he, he said he was probably 40 or 50 people from the front of the line. So he, along with a very long line of people, spent the next 48 hours camping on a sidewalk waiting to be able to purchase tickets for the concert. Now, as life would happen, some would say luck, uh, some would say that God ordained it and created it. Um, Dave was sitting in a particular spot where there was this young lady of roughly the same age in line right next to him. We'll call her Kristen, okay? So, so Dave and Kristen are sitting next to each other, and after a, a few hours, they strike up a conversation, right? Now, now, Dave would tell the story a little bit different than Kristen. Dave would say that he wooed her during this period. Kristen would say it was initially pretty darn awkward. But they start talking, and eventually, as they talk, they come to find out they share a lot of common interests. Um, just, just all sorts of life, goals that they share in common, uh, dreams for life, and, and, and their hopes for family, and, and just even shared some common sports teams that they liked together. Um, they talked a lot about music, Dave said, and, and they just talked, and they talked, and they talked, and they talked. They talked basically for the next 43 hours before the ticket window opened. And so as they're talking, Dave really starts to, to get this feeling. He, he's just sure now, by the time the ticket window's open, that he's found the love of his life after 43 hours of talking with her, right? And that he would never, ever find another woman who shares his passions like Kristen. And so they begin a relationship of sorts. Eventually, the story gets good. They, you know, he asks her to marry. She says yes, and everything's great. But in the story, um, they go through a process of dating, like most couples do. And they go to all sorts of concerts together, every little small concert venue in the region. It's just every band that Dave loves, Kristen would go with him, and they would, they would see concert after concert, band after band, some that you'd heard of, some nobody had ever heard of, just if it was live music, Dave wanted to be there. Now, Kristen's birthday was coming up, and this is after a couple years of dating. Kristen's birthday's coming up, and Dave's thinking, man, I gotta, I gotta really do something, you know? I really gotta do something. Because he's already at this point asked her to marry him. She said yes. So they're engaged, and he really wants to wow her for her birthday. Well, her hometown happened to be Chicago. They weren't living in Chicago. They were actually living a long ways away from Chicago. So he thought he would surprise her by getting a couple of nights of hotel, pay for tickets for the airplane, and buy two nights in a row worth of concert tickets to go see U2, that band that they had stood in line together waiting for for 48 hours, two plus years ago. He thinks he has put together the greatest, the most amazing birthday present he could ever put together. Romantic, right? Yeah. So he makes a big deal of her birthday, and at the end of the night, he gives her this, this, these tickets, expecting her to just be, oh, wow, excited, 
you know, a hug, jumping for joy, something. But she wasn't. And she looks at him, and she looks at him, and she's not excited. Now, Dave, of course, is confused, I mean, really confused. And so he says, Kristen, uh, what's wrong? And it was then that she said to Dave, you know, I really don't like you two all that much. Never really have. And frankly, I'm not really big on going to concerts much for that matter. <coughs> Dave's head was just spinning at this point, right? I mean, he, he, he's dumbfounded. Finally, he kind of gathers his wits about him a little bit. And he asks her, why have you gone to all of these concerts and seen all of these bands for the last two plus years with me? If that was the case, her answer was simple. I just wanted to be with you, Dave. I never really cared for most of those bands. In fact, I really hated some of them. They were pretty terrible, frankly. But I knew that you liked them, so I wanted to go. And it was at that moment, Dave said, he, he fell back into love with Kristen all over again. He later found out, and he didn't know this, somehow this never came up in conversation, he later found out that Kristen was standing in line to get tickets for an old ex-boyfriend. <laughs> Not even for herself. Crazy, right? But here's what Kristen understood, and, and what she shows all of us. That love is not a feeling or, or even an emotion. Love is an action, right? Love is doing something for someone else. It is sacrificing for someone else. It's placing their wants and their needs and, and their interests before our own. See, Kristen ran after Dave. She pursued him and gave it all that she had. She was willing to place his love for music and concerts over her indifference and at times distaste for it. And she was willing to prove her love by going to countless concerts just so they could be together, right? She ran after Dave because she loved him. And God runs after us because he loves us. God has been called the hound of heaven because like a good hound dog, God is willing to pursue us, to chase after us, no matter what. Jesus tells how God's love literally runs after us in a story that we often call the prodigal son. Many of you have heard this story, right? I've preached it many times. Prodigal son, great story. One of my favorite passages of the Bible. But rather than being called the prodigal son, I think the story probably should be called the story of the loving father, shouldn't it? Now, in the story, the father has two sons, if you're not familiar with it. And his younger son, the younger of the two boys, asks his father if he could get his share of the inheritance early, right? Now, this would be like you and I going to my dad and saying, look, I know, dad, you're going to die someday anyhow, right? So why don't you just give me all of your hard-earned money now instead of later? Because you're dead either way eventually. Now, with most fathers, you can imagine, that wouldn't go over very well, right? If I went to my dad today and said, Dad, well, you know, I don't know how many more years you got in that ticker, but I'd really like that Goldwing motorcycle of yours and... uh, you got some cool tools in the garage. I think my brother and I might as well just split them up right now. What do you think? I would duck. That's what I think. (laughs) One of those tools would be coming towards my head. That wouldn't go over well, right? But in an act of outrageous love, this father gives his son the money. And then his son goes off and he spends all, not even just spends it, wastes it, right? Blows it all, spends all of this hard-earned money on fast living. And when that young man finally runs out of money, when he's finally broke, he, he finds himself working at a pig farm of all places, 
feeding hogs, feeding hogs food that this food I'm feeding these pigs, folks, that looks better than what I ate for dinner last night. These pigs eat better than I do, he's finding. Right? He's there in the slop, in the muck, in the manure. You ever worked with pigs? Oof. They're a smart animal, but not a clean animal. They're not, and, not, and they're actually a fairly clean animal, but they're where they live, not so clean. Right? Manure everywhere. Smelly. They'll eat just about anything you put in front of them. They are God's ultimate recycling machine. They can take anything and make bacon out of it. That is amazing. <laughs> That's a good animal. But here he sees these pigs just eating stuff that, that's better than what he's got back home. And it's in that moment, he finally reaches rock bottom, right? He's broken. He decides, oh, man, my father's pigs eat better than this too. I should go back home. What am I doing here? Maybe if I go back home, maybe my father would take me back in. Probably not as a son, but at least give me a job and let me work so I could like eat something better than the slop. So he heads back home. And this is what it says in Luke 15, 20. It says this about the father. It says, and he, the father, arose, or and he, the son, sorry, he, the son, arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long ways off, while the young son is walking down the road, while he's still a long ways off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran, and embraced him, and kissed him. Now while the son was making his way just over the horizon, right, the father sees him. And let's just stop there for a moment. How is it that the, the father sees the son when he's so far away? My suspicion is that it's because every day, every day, that father spent a little bit of time looking it's today the day my son might come home, scanning the horizon, hoping, praying that he would see his son return home. The loving father had for his son such a, a strong love, despite how his son had treated him, that he had never stopped wanting his son to return. So when the day finally comes that he sees his son on the horizon coming, the father runs out to greet him, right? Right? Again, just stop there for a moment because in Jesus' day, it was not an honorable thing. Men didn't run. Right? You didn't run. That was for kids. As a man, you were dignified. When you run, you stir up the dust and the dirt. It gets all over your, your, your clothes, your shoes, your feet. This is the time of Jesus where the roads weren't paved and the roads got walked on by animals. And what the animals do as animals go walking, if you saw it after the parade yesterday, you'll see it in town. There's some evidence of it. They do it where they walk, and it turns to dust. And when you run into that dust, you get what you get on you, right? If you don't understand that, ask your neighbor later. That's why men didn't run. It wasn't dignified. And you certainly wouldn't run out for a son who not only offended you, but squandered half of your estate, right? But this father, he did run out. He ran out to greet his son because he loved him. His love not only searched for him daily, but his love literally ran out to welcome him home. And this, Jesus says, is the love of God. God pursues us, folks, every day. Every day, God is searching the horizon for us, longing for us to return to Him, to think about Him, or to talk with Him. And when we do make that turn, even though we might be far away from God because of poor choices we might have made that day, that week, that year throughout our lives, God's love runs out to us and welcomes us home. And God's love not only does that, not only does God's love pursue us and forgives us, but when it connects with us, it then changes us. 
You can't be touched. You can't be impacted by the love of God and not be changed. When Dave suddenly realized how much Kristen loved him by going to all those concerts, he said he fell in love with her all over again. Her love helped strengthen his love for her. And that is the same truth with God's love. When we begin to understand just how much God loves us, it melts our hearts and it begins to transform our desires so that we will now want to, to run after God with all of our lives and, and, and have God in every aspect of our life and, and want what God wants for us. This is what we hear about in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. If you're following along, feel free to open a Bible. You can open it on your iPad, iPhone, whatever you got. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2 says this. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight, let us lay aside every sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The author of Hebrews says that living out our faith should be like a race, a race where we love God so much so that we are willing to just run after God constantly, right? Continually. So let me ask, how much do we love God? If, if love is seen as how we persevere, if, if love is seen in how we sacrifice, is, if love is seen in our actions, how much do we love God? What are we willing to do or what are we willing to give or give up in order to fall in love with God? What are we willing to do? Remember, love is an action. So what is it that we are willing to do to fall in love with or to stay in love with or to grow in love with God? Are we willing to run the race with perseverance? Run this race of faith? It is this very race that John Wesley turns to in his third rule. We've been talking about John Wesley and his three rules. Yes, we are a Baptist church, but eh, John Wesley still had some good ideas. So we're talking about these three ideas from John Wesley. And it's this third general rule that he gave his friends... And this third rule is simply this. Stay in love with God. Staying in love with God means that we keep running the race of faith according to Hebrews. There's, there's one thing that can help us run this race. And that one thing it says, if we want to stay in love with God, if we want to keep persevering, if we want to run this race well, in order to do that, we must keep our eyes on the cross. That's what the author of Hebrews says. Keep our focus on the cross. Now we need to stay focused on the cross for uh, a number of reasons. First of all, it reminds us just how much God loves us, right? God loves us so much, so incredibly much, that he was willing to send Jesus, his only son, to lay down his life for us. Today's a communion Sunday. We'll be looking at that. God, the creator. God, the magnificent. God, who knew you and me before he knit us in our mother's womb. That very same God set aside his own interests and sent his son to die so that our own lives could be redeemed, that we could be forgiven, that we could experience eternal life. But then beyond that, the cross also shows us 
what it means to love. Right? You've got a vertical and a crossbar. And the crossbar shows us that our love needs to reach out. Right? Reach out to all of those around us in very real and tangible ways. John Wesley, as he writes and speaks about this, as he was sharing with his friends, he called this love the crossbar of the cross. He called it the axe of mercy. This means doing no harm, as we've spoken about before. And this means doing good, which we also spoke about two weeks ago. It's making sure we don't do things that could tear people apart, things like gossip. But it also means doing things that we can in each and every day and, 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 and in ways um, that we can continue to come alongside and build up and raise up other people. Acts of mercy are like when we feed the hungry, right? When we clothe the naked, when we care for the sick and those in need. It's when we send shoeboxes with Operation Christmas Child, right? It's when we help provide food for the Aiken food shelf, right? It's when we give to many places we as a church give to, we as church families give to. Acts of mercy are when we reach out in love to someone who is lonely and in need. In my last two sermons, we've been talking about those very acts of mercy and showing uh, this kind of love to others and what that might look like as we reach out in love, as we love others. And as we do that, we are in then some sense, by loving others, we are loving God, right? God first loved us that we might love others. And so as we love others, we are showing God's love. But the cross isn't just only that crossbar piece, right? There's also the vertical part. The part that stuck into the ground. And that part also needs to be our focus. And anything that comes along and helps strengthen our personal relationship with God, John Wesley called that part acts of piety. So the vertical are acts of piety. The horizontal are acts of mercy. The acts of piety include things like prayer, the reading of the Bible, reflecting on God's word, sharing communion together, Wesley would have said. And it's in these disciplines and in these activities, or as they called them, in these methods, that's where Methodists come from. These were the methods through which they were going to grow spiritually. It's in these activities that we are able to stay in love with God. Think about prayer. Prayer, some of us are, you know, some of us feel like, I don't know if I'm a good prayer, right? I haven't always been a good prayer. In fact, I, I wouldn't consider myself a great prayer. I'm an okay prayer. I'm a pastor, so I pray. And I'm willing to pray publicly. That's okay. I can make that work. But I don't think I'm the greatest of prayers. I got some friends that are amazing prayers. My wife, she's a better prayer than I am. I went to seminary with a guy. His name is Sammy Wignone. Some of you might have heard of Sammy. He's an evangelist, a Billy Graham evangelist. Sammy, I would pay money to hear that man pray. Man, can that guy pray. It's amazing. But I'm an okay prayer. And when we pray, if you've ever felt inadequate in your prayer life, like me, just remember that praying is simply having a conversation with God. It's talking with God. And then, but it's more than that, it's talking with God. It's then, though, also being quiet, being still and listening to God. So often we can talk to God, but many times we're not very good at listening to God. We all know that any good relationship, whether it's in a marriage or a relationship with our kids or our friends, in order for it to be a healthy relationship, it has to have conversation. We need to talk with one another, a two-way street. We need to share our hopes and share our dreams and our needs with others. And in this case, with God. And as we share, as we have these conversations, just as when you and I have conversations with others, our relationships grow. So as we pray, as we come into conversation with God, 
our relationship grows, our piety grows. No healthy relationship, relationship can survive without conversation, in fact. No, no marriage works without conversation, without communication. No family can remain strong without sharing and listening to one another. Every friendship needs times where we can speak and where we can sit together and just be there for one another. Sometimes listening in silence. And it's the very same, very same truth in our relationships with God. There's no way we can stay in love with God without good communication with God. We need times where we share our hopes and our dreams and our fears and our doubts with God. And then we listen, knowing that God will do the same for us. In Dave and Kristen's story, they came together because they had 48 hours of talking, well, 43 by the time they really got the conversation going, with 43 hours of talking and sharing and listening. In the story of the loving father, the prodigal son, it was when the young son's life finally came to a stop, when he finally hit rock bottom. It was only then that he was able to hear in his head and in his heart the true love of his father. If we are going to stay in love with God, we need, absolutely need times of prayer. We need to remember that prayer is not just giving God our, our long list of things that we want, right? God isn't some magic genie in the sky whose who's little home we can go and rub and he pops out and gives us our three wishes. He's not a vending machine for us to insert our wants and expect to get back out our desires. Prayer is not just telling God about all those people who are sick and all those people who are in need, but it's also sharing with God our hopes and our fears and our dreams. Yes, tell God about the sick. Yes, Share with God about the needs. Yes, come before God with your disappointments, your frustrations, your fears, and your worries. God is always willing to listen to the depths of our heart. But remember, we also need to be willing to listen to Him. The Bible has an entire book. Maybe you don't know this, maybe you do. The Bible has an entire book dedicated to this very thing to communicating with God. It's called the Psalms, right? If you don't know where to start, if you don't know how to start having a conversation with God, if you struggle in your prayer life, just open to the book of Psalms. Open to any of them, but open to the book of Psalms and maybe Psalm 145 is a great one to start with. Go there. Find the words of love, of praise and adoration and read through it and pray through it and then sit in silence for a while listening for where God might speak to you. Come before God with words of confession and thanksgiving and love. And as we do that, our love, our relationship with our Creator God will grow. But prayer is just one of the means in which we can stay in love with God. There, there are others. Prayer is one. Prayer is a strong one. Prayer is a grand one. Prayer should be one of them. But Wesley did mention a few other things if we want to stay in love with God. He, he, he uses the word ordinances, right, as means for connecting with God. The ways that God has made available to us for us to connect with Him. So there's prayer, but there's also the reading of God's Word. Spending a little devotional time every day reading your Bible reflecting on it. And then finally, the one we'll close our service with today, there's communion. There's coming together. For Wesley, communion was, was a means of God's grace, in fact. Remember, Wesley was an old Anglican, right? And communion is, for him, he thought, one of the primary ways in which God's grace and love flowed into our hearts and lives. That's what he believed. And it is certainly an activity that helps us 
stay in love with God. Every time that we come together before the table, every time we pass the communion, every time we come together and remember the sacrifice and love of Jesus together, it helps us keep our relationship with God and with one another strong. Studies have shown that families that eat together are stronger families. Study after study after study. It's best if they eat together in the home, but if they don't, it's still useful to eat together, even at a restaurant, because those families coming together have to sit down facing one another and spend time with one another. Right? And when we come to the communion table, it is a time for us to pause, a time for us to reflect, a time for us coming together, breaking of bread together in a way that is far deeper than any other meal we might have. When we come together at the communion table, when we share this meal with Jesus, we are listening to his words. We are seeing his love in action as he serves us, as he sacrifices for us. And it can be at the communion table where we can fall in love all again with Jesus. So communion and prayer and reading God's word are all important acts of piety that help us stay in love with God. And we do these as we gather together in worship. Gathering together is another one of those important things. Gathering together was one of those fundamental key items that Wesley saw as one of the things that helps us grow in faith. It was the gathering together corporately as a body of believers, as an ecclesia, as the, the gathered ones as a church. But the other thing that John Wesley figured out was gathering together in small groups was exceptionally powerful for helping people grow spiritually. I'm going to diverge a little bit from a normal sermon right at that point because I've been talking for months about us getting some small groups started and we're at the cusp of that time. I'm at that point right now where we need some of you to step forward in faith and say, I would like to be in that first group. What is that first group going to be? Well, that first group is a pilot group. That first group, after we've gone through the first study together, will then become the leaders of other small groups. Some of you here today, I'm hoping, will join in on that. Some of you here today, I'm hoping, will say, yes, I want to grow spiritually, and I want to grow spiritually with some of these people in this church. And I, I'm willing to step out in faith and take a little bit of a risk and facilitate that. What will it look like? Well, initially, it'll be you, you and I, or you as a couple and I and a group Together, we're going to do a study together where I can model small groups for you in case you've not been in one before. We'll go through a short curriculum together. We'll study, and then I will set you free. And we'll have the opportunity to have six, eight, ten other small groups then from that. These groups can meet in your home. They can meet here at church. They can meet at a coffee shop. There's a community room in the library in town. You can meet over at the Glen store. I don't care. But it's a place to meet, to gather together, to come together, to encourage one another, to pray for one another, to serve with one another, to love on one another in a small group. Because in those small groups, I have found amazing life transformation can happen. And that was one of the secrets John Wesley saw as well. Put together people in small groups, have them all start working in the same direction on the same things, and amazing things happen. And I want that for us here at Glory. I want that for you. Not because I get anything out of it, other than I get the joy of seeing you living out the horizontal and the vertical that we've been talking about. The acts of mercy and the acts of piety together. So my challenge to you as we wrap this up today this is our last sermon in this series, is give it a little thought, give it a little prayer. Think about if you maybe want to be a host 
or if you would in the future, in this fall, be willing to be part of one of those small groups where we can come together, where we can break bread together. It might not be communion, but it may be brownies, right? Or Rice Krispie Cakes, or maybe you'll do a barbecue together. I don't know. Something. And you'll come together and study God's Word. And you'll come together and pray for one another. And you'll come together and serve others in our community together. So give it some thought. Give it some prayer. Think about if you would like to be part of that. Because I would like you to be part of that. Moving forward, I think this is going to be a great thing for our church. I'm excited. Truly excited for what God is doing and what God is going to do here at Glory. And I'm glad you're all along for that ride. Let's pray and we'll have some communion. How's that sound? Amen? Let's pray.